Five years after the War of the Chosen, Earth is at peace. Humans and aliens live in harmony, having swapped hit percentages for hitting it off. Thank God developer Firaxis spiced things up by throwing in some baddies though. It wouldn't be much of an XCOM game if your missions revolved around grinning at bulbous-headed extraterrestrials now, would it? Clear. In truth, thank God we just have a new XCOM game. A different kind of XCOM game. At a glance, Chimera Squad's grid-based battles are familiar, but when you look a little closer you see a timeline that highlights an alternating turn system and a roster of good guys that aren't all human. I can understand why they opted to forgo a number on this title, this isn't the XCOM you're used to playing. So positioning this as a standalone game will surely make its changes more palatable to those who've been fans for the last decade. Releasing it a week after its reveal is something everyone can get on board with though, surely. More of that, please, developers and publishers. If you're watching this in the first week of the game's launch, know that you can nab the game for less than a tenner on Steam, which is something you should most definitely do. Of course, if you'd like to know why, then please do stick around and watch the rest of this video. If XCOM Chimera Squad is back up to full price by the time you're watching this, then, well, you should have been subscribed to the Rock Paper Shock on YouTube channel, silly. That way you would have seen this review the day it was published. It's okay though, if you press that lovely subscribe button now, we won't break through your windows and shoot you dead in broad daylight. We would have left that to Chimera Squad anyway. Let's start with the basics, and here everything is governed by the new timeline. Unlike missions in older XCOM games where you would take all your turns and then your opposition would take all theirs, Chimera Squad sees both sides alternating turns mapped out on this timeline. While the rest is recognisable, each agent has two action points to use on movement, shooting or abilities, and you can find cover behind handily placed waist high walls as well as some full adult walls, the timeline forces you to think more carefully than you may have done before. If you're in close proximity to two separate targets, let's say number two and number six, taking out the one that's near the top of the timeline is more advantageous to you, as their opportunity to act will come before the other. It also inspires some safety play from time to time. Getting behind cover and blocking certain assault from whomever is up next to the Aki can be more valuable than taking the shot that you're almost guaranteed to miss. I know some people have beef with alternating character turns. It's harder to strategize and play violent domino rallies when the future is so variable. It's one of the criticisms we hear a lot about Divinity Original Sin, for example. But Chimera Squad gives you some vital control over your fate. Your agents have a couple of shared abilities that allow you to manipulate when a squad mate can take their turn. Team Up, which can be utilized once per mission, enables you to force an agent to the top of the timeline, and Preparation will push one of your squad to an earlier place in the order, whilst also boosting their defense. This system is a revelation. As great as the action was in the previous two XCOM games, this is preferable because it adds clarity to the order of events. We advance. Not that it's easier, you're not always in a position to off the bad guys in a nice simple order. Frequently you have to make a choice whether to take the surefire shot on someone that's going to act later on, or risk it all by chancing the next enemy in the timeline. It just gets you to prioritise your actions and marks. Even if customization and permadeath return in XCOM 3, I hope this turn system makes the jump to the main series. Breaching. We shall move in. And it's not as if grand team strategies are eliminated entirely, rather they're condensed into a rush of action at the start of an encounter. Rather than drop you into a battlefield, Chimera Squad lets you announce your arrival by giving you the chance to burst through the door and pop some bastards in the face before you've even made it to the taking turns bit. This pre-combat combat phase is called Breach Mode and, in short, it's brilliant. At the beginning of every encounter you're given the choice of a couple of entry points, each leading into an area that will see you clash with some nasties. 
Each point has modifiers attached, good and bad, that will affect those who go through it. All units entering here get a plus 25 aim during the breach. Last unit through this entrance will have their weapon disabled. First unit through here is guaranteed to land their first shot. That sort of thing. Breach points have between 1 and 4 slots available, meaning you can split your team up however you like if you want maximum coverage of the arena. Or, if you prefer, you can send everyone through the one door like a schlocky yet effective 80s action movie. Certain breach points are only available to select members of Chimera Squad, as well as those with a special item like a key card which can open security doors or a breaching charge which can destroy walls. It's always good to take note of how many baddies are lying in wait behind each entrance. A 1v5 battle may not end very well for you. This pre-game section of the battle doesn't end there though, no no no. Once you're through the door, you have an opportunity to take a shot at the bad guys, but you have to be mindful of their response to your presence. For example, those who have been alerted will use an ability during the breach sequence, while surprised enemies will suffer a defence penalty. It's an excellent layer of strategy that sees you planning from the word go, as you can even determine the order in which points are breached and agents enter. You can make a statement by sending the strongest in first, but perhaps you'd prefer to save them till last. Certain members of the squad also have unique breaching abilities that can be of use when pulled out at the right time. Verge can propel an enemy into the air, leaving them without cover, while Godmother can use Alpha Strike, which sees her blasting a baddie with her shotgun and ensuring she takes her turn earlier on the timeline. Two minutes out. Hey, Godmother. Is this like the old days? XCOM swooping in and taking it to the bad guys? I wouldn't know. I spent most of the world training resistance networks. You might have noticed I mentioned Verge and Godmother there. This is not my actual Godmother that I've built in a character creator. Previously, XCOM has allowed you to customize your soldiers. You could tinker with their appearances, change their names. Hell, in the 2016 sequel, you could write full biographies. This enabled us to send an army of loved ones onto the battlefield. Aunt Mary was gifted with her assault rifle, even after her Dennis perished at the hands, claws, legs, limbs of a chrysalid. What a trooper. Unfortunately, Nana can no longer become the hero of the resistance because apart from making your squad look like a well-armed JLS tribute act, customization is minimal. The Chimera Squad is an elite group of individuals, all with their own names, faces, backstories, the lot. They've all got their own personalities too, as one-dimensional as they often are. See this big incredible Hulk looking lad? You think he's angry, don't you? Well, yeah, yeah he is. Whilst troops engage in some inoffensively fine small talk in between missions. Respect your squad and they will respect you. I don't care if they respect me. You care. Whatever. Their main purpose is to shoot their guns, kill the evil people, repeat. They need to put a stop to a group of insurgents that are waging war against the idyllic City 31 and god damn it that's exactly what they'll do because they're the best in the biz. Regardless of whether or not the 11 agents of Chimera Squad are fully formed, their survival is paramount to the mission's success. If one of your squad dies on the battlefield, you have to restart at the most recent checkpoint. Yes, permadeath is a thing of the past. Instead, when one of your team reaches zero health, they begin to bleed out. If you don't stabilize them within a certain number of turns, which takes them out of the action for the remainder of the mission, then they will die and you will fail. If you played Mutant Year Zero, with its similar system, you'll know that far from stripping a game of the tension of permadeath, it adds a different kind of fear. Deciding between aiding your downed squad mate or availing of the opportunity to take out a dangerous foe that's near death is gloriously nerve-wracking. Keeping every member of your troop healthy at all times is critical because if an agent's HP drops below half, then there's a chance they could develop a scar, which will debuff a core stat like mobility or aim. And if you want to heal a scar, which you you will, you'll have to stick the injured soldier into training back at HQ. And while they're convalescing, they can't go out on missions. A sort of temper death, if you will. A fine balance between old and new. Purists may scoff at the notion of an XCOM that doesn't see death as final, but losing a leveled up terminal or verge would crush a lot more than seeing your mother croak before your eyes. Sorry ma'am, but I just can't lie to the lovely RPS viewers.
What your heroes lack in looking like your dad, they make up for in unique skills that let you build four person squads as you see fit. Cherub's pistol doesn't pack much punch, but his team protecting kinetic shield is top notch. Torque? the Viper Inquisitor, incapacitates scum with boa constrictor hugs and repositions allies in the line of fire with her ginormous tongue. Axiom is a mutant breaker, which is XCOM speak for absolute unit. He can occasionally shrug off tactics after doling out some mega hurt. The psionic sectoid Verge can use his mind to stun, manipulate and harm bad guys on the battlefield. And Godmother is just really f***ing good at shooting things. Over the course of the game you can level up your agents, so their unique qualities only evolve. And as good as they are on their own, these powers sing when you combine one with another. Terminal's cooperation ability, which gives one of your other teammates a bonus immediate action, can be a stylish, emphatic full stop to a mission. While Claymore's penchant for explosives means you can throw a grenade at a target and have one of your other agents detonated prematurely with a single bullet. Wonderfully, there isn't an overpowered Fab Four here. Over the course of the game, you'll amass 11 members of Chimera Squad, and there's no doubt some will become your favourites. Do I need to show you more of this absolute beast? But seeing each agent go from zero to hero as they level up encourages you to take newer additions on missions to discover more worthwhile powers. Each member of the squad provides something different, something beneficial. A few even before it's their turn to move about the grid. All this good stuff works in unison to create a different XCOM game. Just the fact that someone has used a dehumidifier to remove the fog of war and reveal the full map of each encounter makes this a far purer tactics game than before. Each mission is split across several of these encounters, further chopping the game down. Yes, the unexpected can still occur, surprise reinforcements aren't totally uncommon, but being given access to the whole map right away lets you crack on with implementing your tactics for these little Sabutio murderers. The brisk pace means no area has the chance to become a slog, which further feeds into the game's newfound sense of pace. Given the focus on shock of all of breaches, you might think the game would forego the wider geoscape strategic layer, the global command that kept you spinning plates in previous games. But not so. From your swanky HQ, you can see City 31 and its nine districts and pick your missions as you wish. Events are governed by an in-game calendar as each mission is somewhat time sensitive. Critical missions, for instance, will need to be completed by a certain time, while side quests will only be available for a day. Ignore a particular district and its unrest meter rises. Once full, overall city anarchy will go up. If that maxes out, then it's game over. Now you can combat this by completing tasks in an unruly region or by calling on field teams to cool the situation. Using a resource called Intel, you can purchase these field teams and stick them in areas that are kicking off. They grant you significant powers such as the ability to lower a district's unrest level at the click of a button, as well as the capability to reduce overall city anarchy. Basically, you just need to make sure you're tending to every section of the map. While admittedly not as stressful or complicated as the apocalyptic scenarios of earlier games, managing City 31 has enough bite to keep you engaged. I often found myself tearing my hair out over whether to complete a mission in one area to lower a district's unrest meter, or take the hit and do another mission that would provide me with greater rewards, like a, a cool gun attachment or something. Regularly, and begrudgingly, I might add, I decided to help the inhabitants of City 31. I knew it was the right thing to do. Doesn't mean I'm not cross about it. I missed out on a really cool gun attachment. Tower or flee? Your choice. Hey, check it out. Headquarters sent us an assembly. And with the right patterns, we can build anything. Your headquarters isn't just a giant map where you can keep an eye on the occupants of City 31. It's got a legitimate shop, a black market, an armory, a training facility, a research station, and a bulletin board sort of type. Thing. The two areas that demand your attention the most are assembly and training. Assembly is where you research new items, as well as upgraded armor and weapons. These jobs often take a few days to complete, but the process can be sped up if you stick one of the troops in there. Training, as mentioned earlier, can be used to heal the scars that members of Chimera Squad get on the battlefield, but it can also be used to upgrade an agent's stats too. The only snag with sticking a member of the squad into either assembly or training is that they then can't be part of your combat team for 
for a few days. It's a balancing act, essentially. You have to decide whether it's necessary for a pivotal member of the team to increase their utility slots if it means they'll miss out on a huge story mission. Decisions made in HQ feel important because there's a knock-on effect that could cost or aid you in the long run. Because of that heft, few things here feel wasted. Sure, the odd jobs notice board isn't something that constantly needs your attention, and you won't need to buy everything that's on sale in the shop, but the meteor choices you make here will have an impact once you're out there. We are through the checkpoint. I was never actually at that. But they were fitting you for a blocky helmet. Stow it, both of you. We're here. 3 1 PD gave us the all clear. Grab your gear and prepare to move in. The Chimera Squad may lack some oomph when it comes to character. You can hear them nattering away at HQ, but they don't give you a reason to actually listen. Although, on the battlefield, like many things in this game, it's a different story. Their individuality means some are better than others in certain situations, and the way in which their abilities interact is joyous. Using Team Up, for example, and influencing the order of the exceptional new timeline system is terrific. Not to mention the rush of panicking a group of enemies with the new Breach mode. XCOM Chimera Squad has done that wonderful thing of giving fans of the series something they didn't even know they wanted. Except rather than one single thing, it's given us about four. If you liked this review of XCOM Chimera Squad, then it would be lovely if you liked this video. Just press that little thumbs up button there. On top of that, if you could subscribe to Rock Paper Shotgun, that would be doubly lovely. Remember to ring that bell so you'll be notified of all future videos and live streams too. If you're looking for more RPS content to watch, why not have a gander at one of these? And as always, RPS appreciates you watching this far into one of our reviews. So here's a picture of Wes Hoolan celebrating his goal against Sweden at Euro 2016. Good times. Thanks for watching. Go on, get out of here.